Good morning. This is Bill from out of Europa, Naples on a, well, you know, it's not really a lovely Florida Thursday. In fact, not at all. Uh, it's humid. It's muggy. It's been raining for days. I don't mind the rain. I think the rain is great. It keeps the clouds over the sun, keeps things from getting too uh, baking hot. But at the same time, when the sun bakes off the humidity in the ground, it becomes almost unbearable, swamp-like absolutely swamp-like. So uh, if you're anywhere, anywhere other than here with temperatures, uh, you know, somewhere in the zone of what humans can tolerate, enjoy it. Enjoy it. You could be down here suffering through mosquitoes the size of sparrows, and uh, we have all of a sudden got this infestation of flies everywhere. Uh, there's something like the vegetable somewhere rotting. I don't know, but apparently it's breeding flies by the millions, and I suppose that's good for the birds. We got one up there. Hopefully they're eating the flies, but they're not eating enough of them. And, uh, well, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, we could get into this whole apocalypse thing going. We've moved on, which is great. We've gone from the virus now to uh, the end of the world in terms of uh, burning, looting, protesting. Uh, fantastic. Wonderful. 2020 is really turning out to be such a nice year. Uh, definitely one that we're all going to cherish and remember for many, many decades to come. Uh, actually, it can't end soon enough. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, we do have a race weekend coming up this weekend. Thank God, a little bit of a return to normalcy for us. Uh, even though they say we have to wear masks on the infield at Sebring at the track so we don't infect, I don't know what, fire ants. That's what they have there more than anything. So uh, I guess to keep the fire ants safe, we're all going to be wearing a mask. But it's a small price to pay uh, to be able to get the hell out of town for the first time in a long time and uh, enjoy a race, uh, a race weekend. Also supposed to rain all weekend. But again, I don't care. I don't even care if we get out on the track. It doesn't matter to me. It's just nice to get the hell away from here for a while and uh, do something else. But anyway, if you tuned into this thing, it's not to hear me ramble on. Uh, it's going to be about this R129 Mercedes-Benz SL Roadster and why I like it and why I think it's not just an aspiring collectible but a fantastic daily driver. Uh, you know, they, uh, recently I've been doing videos about uh, whether or not the average guy can afford to maintain this Benz or that Benz. And generally the answer is no. And I would have to say, the, look at the flies. Look at the friggin' flies on this thing. everywhere. Nothing I have a hell with it. Um, anyway, whether the average Joe can maintain one, and if you want to ask about one of the, the right back, exactly where I blew him off, he's back again. These things are very persistent. Uh, but anyway, uh, can an average guy own and maintain an R129? Yeah, probably not, but who cares? Uh, it's the last car that you have a shot at anyway, certainly the last SL that you do. Uh, this was uh, Bruno Sacco, very famous designer for Mercedes-Benz. Probably a seminal moment uh, would have been the 190E, if you remember that car in the early 80s. Uh, not really just because of the way the design looked. Uh, well, I suppose it is because of the way the design looked, but, um, well, okay, I, uh, point being, everything when that car came out uh, had so much bling, it looked like it was on the way to a, a, you know, a rap music awards session or something. I mean, everything was, the, the cheapest Toyota Corolla was covered in chrome and shiny diamonds and bejeweled bits. And then along comes this 190E with barely a hint of chrome on it. And it looked modern and stately and lovely, took the world by storm, and uh, definitely laid down a baseline for the next uh, eh, decade or so of Mercedes-Benz design, all spearheaded by the Italian, <laughs> Bruno Sacco, uh, who is a hell of a designer. And he thought of this car, this R129 Roadster, as his masterpiece, uh, at least at the time. He loved it. And, uh, and well, he should. Uh, it came out uh, in 1989 in Europe, 1990 here in the States, and it had big shoes to fill. Uh, it was the fourth generation SL, which has now definitively been determined to stand for super light, by the way. You can argue with me, but don't. It's out there on the 
the web at Mercedes itself says it's super light. They found something in the archives. Uh, but it was the fourth generation of the car that began with the 300 SL Gullwing, one of the most iconic cars of all time. So every SL that followed obviously had enormous shoes to fill. Uh, the second gen SL was the Pagoda. Uh, the third generation SL was the R107, which was on every TV show and movie from 1972 to 1990. Uh, a very attractive of car and then after this 129 came the R230 that folding hardtop thing uh, which is you know a great car in its own way but I don't believe that it's going to be collectible in the sense that a nice old guy is going to be able to maintain it and that's what makes the 129 special to me uh, but we'll get into that in a moment so uh, anyway this thing comes out obviously they had 20 look at the flies there's hundreds God, I'm gonna put some fly spray in a fucking bazooka or something. Everywhere, everywhere. They should really spray with mosquito control. When I was a kid, they had this fleet of DC-3s that would fly overhead, uh, dumping out, you know, just wads and wads of toxic smoke. And it was such a beautiful sound and sight. You know, they'd come over at four or five in the morning and sort of a World War II bomber formation, the big radial engines churning, pumping out this crap that would kill the mosquitoes. And it was just epic. Those are long gone. It's a shame. We lost something when mosquito control got rid of their DC-3s. But uh, anyway, how I long for those now. Uh, also, we had these trucks that pumped out the smoke. And when I was a kid, me and my buddies used to follow them around inhaling it. Uh, which is probably why I'm the way that I am today. Uh, well, amongst other reasons, but um, there was the time my parents abandoned me in that gas station as a kid. But well, anyway, the, the 129 came out uh, filling a 20 year run of the R107, which was incredibly popular and successful. And it obviously there was enough time to make the car an absolute sea change in terms of technology, design, performance, function. And it did. I mean, I tell you what, you know, you look at it now and it, it, you could compare it to any number of stuff on the market and say, oh, it's not as fast or it's not as technological. At the time, it was. Uh, it came out with the M119 V8. There were some sixes, but who cares? Uh, and the 119 V8 was this 32 valve, uh, four cam, 330 horsepower V8 engine that had more horsepower than some Ferraris on offer at the time. Uh, and there just wasn't much else. I mean, you had the 911, you had the Jaguar XJ, uh, and they were fine and they were nice cars. But this was it. I mean, if when you arrived in an SL, you were arriving in essentially the state of the art, uh, ultimate, uh, you know, let's enter the 90s kind of car. And that really continued all the way through the decade. It was a star of TV and film. Uh, Clint Eastwood famously drove one in that rookie movie. They crashed through some warehouse window and looked over at Charlie Sheen. And uh, then they did some coke on the center. Oh, no, they did what he engineered like no other, whatever it was. It was all a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat thing, and like every SL before it, it was a, uh, a tremendous star. And you can see why. The design is incredibly handsome. It's got this long nose with flies on it. <sighs> Christ. <clears throat> back again. Anyway, and the V12 has a longer nose than the uh, the V8 and V6, or inline six models, which is pretty neat. Uh, it has this raked windshield, uh, very stubby tail. Uh, the car looks sporty. I mean, Mercedes might call it a sports car. It really isn't. I mean, it's, you know, like that Jaguar uh, XK8 that we did the other day. Uh, it's really more of a grand tour with uh, two seats. Uh, but uh, it's sporty enough, certainly for the clientele. And this was built during a Mercedes-Benz era when money was not really the point. The cars were engineered to a standard. They, they, they didn't even think about price when they built them. Uh, the engineers were in charge. They put the car together the way they wanted to, and then they slapped a price tag on it afterwards. And this was the SL that really tested what the market would bear. Uh, when it came out in 1990, it was essentially like 150 grand in today's dollars. Uh, you know, we're talking like Bentley money, that kind of thing and uh, very, very different from the ones that came before it in terms of price. And people did pay it. In fact, they lined up for it. 
Uh, they put down deposits. They, you know, you couldn't get one in the first year or two. Uh, very, very popular and successful car. And uh, widely unknown as they sold almost as many of them in their, <clears throat> you know, 12 years of production as they did of these uh, R107s in their 20 years of production. Uh, over 200,000. So there's lots of them out there. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are now turds. You have to really seek out the nice ones. Uh, this car, okay, real quick. It's a 98 model. It's a 600. It's the V12. Has 14,000 miles. It's finished in white over a lovely two-tone beigey taupey thing. And uh, it's going to be exclusively sold on Bring a Trailer. It's not going to be up on our website. Uh, you know, bring a trailer has a great delay time, so uh, you probably won't see it up there for another 10 to 10 to 15 days or so. But it's going to go up there, and uh, we'll see how it does. Uh, it's a fantastic collectible. Uh, but anyway, back to the review. Uh, you can see this one has Xenon lights. It's got the AMG Sport package, which came out to really help the, uh, you know, when the car sort of... Uh, after a few years, it, it didn't look quite as sporty as the other stuff out there, and then this package sort of helped them. Look at those big monoblox, the rocker panels, the treatment on the front and rear bumpers, uh, even the ride height's fantastic. Just really good AMG type stuff. But anyway, so the 129 came out, people went nuts for it, and it had a lot of technology. But it also was the point in Mercedes-Benz history where analog and digital met at a crossroads. And that's why today I think the average guy uh, with a little bit of perseverance can easily own and maintain one of these things. I also think it's going to be the last really collectible SL because, again, a guy who's maintaining, you know, 8 to 15 cars or whatever he has in his collection, uh, he doesn't want to sit there worrying about can bus issues and uh, digital overcompensators and flux capacitors like you're going to find in that uh, R230 SL. Uh, this thing, the average guy with a little bit of skill and luck, uh, can certainly maintain on his own. And that's what makes it kind of cool. And of all of the SLs, I do believe that the V12 models uh, are going to be the ones that uh, people are really looking for, particularly the later ones like this. Uh, you can see, again, those big monoblocks. These things really do benefit from the sport package. That may be, to me, the best-looking wheel Mercedes-Benz ever made, and it very much fits this car. Uh, 98, this year was the last year of the uh, stepper uh, taillights, these sort of classic Mercedes-Benz lights, which functional design is to keep dust and dirt. If the car's running through the desert or uh, in the mud or whatnot, this gets all caked up, but it doesn't get caked up on the inside ridges, so you're still able to see the taillights. That's just part of the lovely sort of detailed engineering that these cars have. Uh, also, the soft top uh, in this gen used 10 hydraulic cylinders to operate, and uh, even if it looks pretty standard and pedestrian now, it was completely unheard of in 1990 when these cars came out. You would run that top outside a restaurant and it would draw a crowd. It was just that uh, advanced for its time. Uh, brilliantly, they drew on the W124, I wish I had one here to show you, but one of the great Mercedes sedans of all time. Uh, instead of trending towards the S, which is unreliable, uh, they trended towards the 124 for the subcomponents of this car, the frame, the monocoque, that sort of thing, and uh, that certainly did help make the car more reliable. Uh, it used a double wishbone up front, trailing links in the back. Uh, you could get, you know, different technological advances came out with this car. Traction control, uh, a limited slip differential, uh, an aromatic suspension that would raise and lower itself accordingly. Uh, adjustable dampening. Uh, one of the neatest features, and we'll get into it, we're in the car, is this roll bar uh, that acts as another fly, acts as part of the uh, SRS system, so to speak, and in the event of a rollover, will pop up in like 0.3 of a second and uh, keep your head uh, uh, safe from, you know, crashing into the pavement. So pretty neat stuff. Uh, like the 107, and unlike the R230 next to it, it used a hard top soft top system, very traditional Mercedes thing on the SL. Uh, we'll run the soft top up here in a minute, and I'll try to pause the video if uh, our detailer ever shows up and get that hard top on, uh, but does use a nice two top system. So there's the hard top. This one did have the optional pano roof, which is rare and lovely. 
uh, you can see all the glass uh, uh, you know, on the top of it. Uh, that was the first pano roof in a Mercedes Benz and uh, a very cherished option today. Uh, you can see if you look around here, it had these little things, these little uh, screens you could pull out and uh, keep, the, uh, keep the sun off you. But anyway, fantastic to see and very lovely. Uh, here's the spec car in the garage getting ready. Yeah, it's all ready anyway, ready to load up. Put a new race dash in it and some other crap. So, uh, you know, I'm going to crash. That's inevitable. I crash every event, but uh, hopefully I crash well. Anyway, get back into this. So you could put that hard top on, and when it's sealed down, this thing becomes a very handsome coupe. All right, in the trunk, where our detailer didn't bother to stow properly, uh, was this windscreen, which is a very nice feature at the time. Uh, this would bolt onto that extendable roll bar, and uh, when it was up, not just did it look neat, but it also kept the wind buffeting down. Uh, for a long time, Mercedes-Benz kept a CD changer in the trunk, long after everyone else moved them inside, but eh, it works fine. And the... Uh, uh, this screen does stow nicely behind that area there, leaving enough room for a couple of golf clubs and uh, assault weapons or any other number of things that you want to carry with you when you're out doing things people in Mercedes 12-cylinder cars do. Uh, under there, you've got a full-size spare tire with... Uh, uh, bag of tools and some other crap that's all very nice. Uh, and of course, being this generation of Mercedes, everything is beautifully finished. I love the way the carpeting is finished inside the trunk, the bottom of the deck lid. Uh, I love the hinges. They look different from what's on any other car. Uh, just a, a very, very high quality, well-built item. Uh, this little guy right here will accept this when you lift up the uh, spare tire cover so it'll hold it up in place for you. It's probably fly poo. Uh, to uh, give you access and whatnot. So, anyway, just really neat, well built stuff. Have a look under the hood. Noisy airplanes. Under here is what makes this car to me incredible. I mean, it's all engine. I mean, if you take this thing out, uh, the engine and transmission and set it next to the car. It's about the same size as a Honda Civic. It is enormous. Uh, you know, there was, a, in some ways you could argue that this was the beginning of the insane hyper-technical horsepower wars between BMW and uh, Mercedes and some of the other makers. Uh, yeah, there was this rush to get 12 cylinders. BMW had the 8 series, which you know, is a neat car and a competitor to this one, but it's not a convertible. And if you own one today, you're probably better off maintaining a nuclear submarine. It's going to be a lot cheaper. Uh, but uh, this Benz had the 12 to compete with it. Uh, they strung basically two good inline sixes together. And it's proved to be a very reliable for a 12 cylinder. Don't get me wrong, it's not an Accord, but, uh, you know, for what is essentially an exotic car engine, uh, it's not that bad to maintain. And uh, this M120, by the time it reached 98, it got uh, uh, distributorless ignition, which really helped, uh, improved engine management, and it is silky smooth, quiet, almost 400 horsepower, 420 pound-feet of torque, and it is just one of the most lovely engines ever put in a motor vehicle. Absolutely is. I don't care what it costs me to maintain it. I don't care if, you know, the mass airflow sensors are a thousand bucks. It doesn't matter. Just you know, bring it on, because having this fantastic engine under the hood of this car, it just harkens to me to another place in time. Uh, you know, when, like, Duesenbergs roamed the earth. It was... You know, no expense spared. This was the kind of machine that to me was just amazing. All right, let's have a look inside. I love the V12, the sport badge on the side. Oh, God, I just do like this thing. All right, again, when you're spending $130,000 for a car, you're going to get some stuff for it. Mercedes-Benz saw to that. And uh, here again is where the digital and analog uh, worlds met beautifully to me, absolutely beautifully. This has this classic Mercedes-Benz build quality. You've got the chrome caps. You've got these fancy hinges. Uh, you've got real leather stitched everywhere, uh, you know, with contrasting stuff. You've got a neat little pocket here to put your uh, sidearms or belly 
clubs. You may need that these days. Uh, you got your 16-way or 82-way power seats with memory. Uh, but the way that this car went together was epic in terms of build quality and still harkened to a vintage Mercedes. So, uh, you know, a guy who owned a 72 300 SEL uh, is going to feel comfortable and familiar in this car in a way that he's not in that oval headlighted R230 over there. That's when Mercedes changed. It was almost like the way Volkswagen, or sorry, yeah, ironic, Porsche went from those overbuilt air-cooled things to a Toyota-inspired 996. It's something they had to do, uh, but at the same time, you didn't have to love it. And I think that's true of a car like this. I mean, the build quality of this car is so wood and leather and nuts and bolts German engineering that it's just absolutely lovely. Love these big chunky door handles that you can lift back into your package shelf here. Uh, there's a third row seat essentially. You can stuff a toddler back on top of that. Fortunately, there's no way to strap him down, so you might have to bring your own net uh, to put him in. If I open that, we're gonna find the amp and uh, Bose subwoofer takes up that whole storage compartment. Uh, the other side, let's see what we got in there. Probably nothing. God, I do love that big door handle. Ah, we got a set of books in there. Uh, all very nice stuff. I don't know if we have a window sticker. We're probably not that lucky. But guaranteed this would have been in the $130,000 range, specifically with that uh, Pano hardtop. I don't see it, but there's some extra key stuff and radio codes. What you'd expect to find in a car with 14,000 miles on it. Nice solid thud when you close the door. Lovely ingrained burl wood with flies on it. <sighs> Let's fire it up. All right, so this is going to be special. Uh, we put our key in here. Very, again, classic Mercedes-style uh, key. And I think what has key tip, which means we can just turn the key and let go, and it'll keep going until it starts. But listen to this 12 fire up. It does not have key tip. All right, so that was a later generation. It's got that high torque starter that whirs, and uh, then you just feel that something magical has happened, and then it gets very, very quiet again. Uh, let's run the top so you'll be able to see that. So this big red chunky button here, uh, press that forward. The tonneau cover is gonna pop up. Up is gonna come this beautifully insulated soft top. Even though it comes with a hard top, they did engineer the hell out of the soft top. It's gonna click itself into the header panel there. Pull itself down. Down comes the tonneau. And down goes the top and the back. Keep your finger on the button. And they're gonna squeak their way to the top of the window. So let's have a look at that. And there you can see a lovely black cloth soft top plastic rear window because again, you've got your very fancy hard top if you want to go glass and uh, absolutely lovely and original. Uh, the way you tell if these tops are original, you can see this polyglass uh, stamp here on the bottom corner with the star in it. That's not something you can duplicate, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, once that original top is gone, it's gone, and the stamp is going to be from the aftermarket manufacturer later. Uh, but a very nicely raked uh, rear window, lovely on it, and little corner windows, which seems a bit gratuitous and silly, but again, typical Mercedes over-engineering, and uh, just lovely to see with the uh, top up. Uh, if I'm lucky, I'm going to be able to get the hard top on, so I'm going to give myself a moment to pause here to see if we can. All right, this is great. I did manage to get Marty away from his uh, morning cornflakes and sports page for a minute. Uh, to get the pano roof hardtop installed on this car, uh, which is fortuitous in the video because when the thing's sitting on a stand, you just don't get the full image of how nice the car looks as a two-seat coupe. Uh, it really just becomes something special, particularly so with that lovely glass hardtop. Uh, you can see the design. Just, you know, again, this was a beautiful hardtop on the R107s, and it's also a beautiful hardtop 
on the R129s, and it's now something that's lost with the advent of the folding hardtop. It's just not something you're going to see anymore from Mercedes or anyone else, because it's just too damn expensive compared with having a all-in-one roof. Uh, but uh, again, absolutely gorgeous. Really makes the car different. It winterizes it, if that's your thing. If you're going to drive something like this in the Alps, now you can do it without... Uh, sacrificing you know comfort and convenience based on a uh, convertible you know with a soft top it just doesn't hold out the inclement weather as much uh, but this hard top certainly will and looks fantastic so very nice addition to these cars and uh, if you're going to collect an R129 even if it's a pain in the ass to store one uh, you're uh, certainly better off having it from a collectible point of view because they all came with it, it wasn't an option uh, it's something they should have had uh, but anyway, get the uh, hard top off, soft top back up, and then uh, we'll go for a spin in this thing. All right, anyway, so let's get this top back down and go for a spin. All of this is going to be different if someone shows up and I can get the damn hard top on. Uh, anyway, it all works in the reverse. Up goes the tonneau. It violently <laughs> releases itself from the header panel. It really is pulling that thing down. That is one thing about these SLs, man. When they detach from that panel, you sure can hear them. And it uh, works very, very fast and lovely. Uh, this little rocker switch here, press that and I can run the uh, roll bar up. So stylistically, you can drive around with it like that. Some guys like to, but I think it's a bit silly. Uh, but otherwise, that thing pops up like an airbag to keep you safe when the uh, when the time comes. Let me get that thing back down. All right, so here we have a very nice instrument cluster, very classic Mercedes. You've got your fuel, you've got your silly mile per gallon thing. You've got, oh God, we probably got the protesters going nuts now. It seems too early. It's not even eight o'clock. I can't imagine they're up yet. Uh, you've got your uh, temperature display, your oil pressure, you've got your 160 mile an hour speedo, which this thing's governed to 155, your tack, your clock, a row of classic vintage Mercedes type warning lights, uh, you've got your Mercedes type uh, headlight switch over there, and here's that aromatic suspension that came standard on the V12s and shock dampening, uh, has two different uh, uh, ride heights I believe, you've got one or Let's see, two, so you can change the uh, the actual height adjustment of the car. Uh, it's going to flash until it gets uh, up to where it's going. So let's see if we get there. It'll take a minute to pump itself up. I can feel it rising. In fact, let me hop out while it's doing it. And you can see, all of a sudden we're getting a lot more air inside the uh, wheel well. So. Uh, if you need to lift the car up to get a little bit more ground clearance or entrance onto a trailer, uh, that's exactly how you do it, and it works very, very well. You never know when you need more ground clearance, and then when it's done raising, those lights will stay on as such. But let's get it back down. Uh, over here, this is great, you've got a Miami Vice phone with hands-free dial aid that no longer works at all because it's vintage analog crap, uh, but it's still neat to see it in there. Uh, you got your vents, you've got everything again stitched leather around it, uh, updated climate controls for this year, uh, the radio of course with the CD changer, you got a row of buttons that are all filled in, there's your electronic dampening, here's your stability protection, your traction control, uh, you got a lovely V12 badge looking at you on top of this wooden leather shifter, uh, the wood in here is special to the V12, the wood on this roller is special to the V12, you got some cup holders underneath it, uh, no glove box but eh, you're gonna have to make do I think you got one here in the center console and uh, there is the rest of that great Mercedes phone which uh, you know again Don Johnson would have found familiar love to see it still in there though uh, these seats before we go let me show you this were the first of their kind to have the seat belts within the seat itself, not attached to points on the car. They used magnesium frames, they were ultra supported and strong enough to have the seat belt in the seat itself. The benefit of that is no matter where you move the seat, you're always uh, just absolutely perfect for the driver. Uh, they're you know, strapped in as they should be, whether you're uh, Hervé Villachez or Mean Joe Green, you got enough room in this thing to, uh, to, to have perfect seat comfort. 
comfort. Uh, you got a row of uh, lumbar stuff, again, being the V12, it has the sort of additional, you know, seat settings, all very nice stuff, and uh, very, very lovely all around. Uh, this is a little bit of shame. We've got a little wood degradation uh, famous on these. You know, again, when limited production like this, they probably, you know, had one in seven of these cars were V12s and not many had the wood and leather steering wheel. So not really a part they would have time or heat tested. Fortunately, that did get a little bit of cracking over the years. But as far as I could tell, it's the only significant flaw in the car. Unlike the car it replaced, it has a power tilt and telescoping steering wheel. You can move it up, down, in, out. Uh, in earlier SL129s, these uh, center view mirrors were power operated. Uh, literally everyone broke them, adjusting them manually, so Mercedes cleverly stopped doing that. Uh, even the sun visors are stitched leather. At least you got something for your 130 grand. And by the way, it does use a bulletproof 5G Tronic five-speed <clears throat> automatic transmission. Uh, now the steering in the car, it's recirculating ball, feels a bit vintage to be honest. Uh, it doesn't respond as, as sort of tightly and lovely the way that a racket pinion does, but it also does inspire a tremendous sense of solid confidence. And I cannot describe to you the feel of quality in this car as you're driving. You feel it in every square millimeter of this thing. Uh, it is quiet, commanding. Uh, you know, the, the traditional buyer for this thing had a lot more money than even your average Mercedes buyers. I mean, we're talking captains of industry or dictators would buy the, uh, the SL600. And the car had to suit them. Man, did it. Just effortless, effortless torque. And we got big boats here. This van's not going to want to let me over. And then from the kick down, it just flies. It just absolutely flies. Uh, the brakes are incredible. They stop the car extraordinarily quickly. And again, the point of this thing is not insane sporty driving. It's grand touring comfort, uh, you know, where people look at you like, you know, who the hell is that guy driving this thing? Because back in the day, if you drove this car, you were definitely somebody. Today, you could be any old schlep like me, but yeah, back then you had to be a pretty cool cat. So here it is. This is a 98 Mercedes-Benz SL600 Roadster, uh, V12 power, 14,000 miles on this car. Makes it very collectible in my mind. Nice color combo, great condition. Look for it in a couple weeks, I'd bring a trailer. Uh, but uh, the point to me of this car in this review uh, is to mention that this is a, a beautiful era of Mercedes that's only now starting to become reappreciated. Some of the best examples out there can be had for peanuts, and uh, I think that's just amazing. Uh, it's where analog and digital met, so you still have all this beautiful Mercedes wall-to-wall -wall carpeting that's lush and lovely, and uh, you know the feel of quality in every detail. Uh, it is a very different world from the cars produced today, and truly in my mind the last of its kind well, anyway thank you for having a look we really appreciate it we'll be back next week with uh, some other fun stuff to review and uh, yeah hang in there <laughs> try to make it to 2021 let's all stick together stay safe and we're all in this the next guy who says we're all in this together I'm gonna friggin punch I'm gonna punch him and if they stay uh, never man anyway thanks for having a look we'll see you soon Take care.